of businesses that sax for my products. And uh, among them, besides making saxophones and doing repairs, is we manufacture necks and we manufacture mouthpieces. And today I want to talk to you about mouthpieces because I think there's more mythology about mouthpieces than any other aspect of the saxophone. And I also think that those of you who repair horns are really dropping the ball by not paying attention to the mouthpiece. Now, let's get a show of hands. How many of you have on your bench a test mouthpiece? And it, right. Okay. And how many of you, after you get the customer's horn right, insist on playing it with the customer's mouthpiece? Almost nobody. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I'm telling you, that if you do a great job on their horn and still leave some problems with their mouthpiece, you ain't done your job. Now, I was fortunate enough when I was a saxophone student of the great Sandy Runyon to get Sandy to teach me about mouthpiece design and about mouthpiece refacing. And one of the things I want to share with you today are some simple things that you can do to check every customer's mouthpiece. Now, I want to admonish you that a lot of these guys have got a mouthpiece they've been playing for 30 years, and it's crooked as a dog's hind leg, but they think it's great. So before you cut on their mouthpiece, <laughs> you know, chat with them about it. But I am going to show you how to diagnose some common mouthpiece problems and show you some easy things you can do about it. And I also want to give you kind of an overview of how mouthpieces work. Now, unlike my good friend Mr. Peterson, uh, I don't have a high-tech, computer-driven presentation. I'm going to draw on the board, and I will not allow any comments on my artwork, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do the best I can. Does that mean we don't have to sit around while you figure out and fuss and get the computer working right? <laughs> That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that way, Jim. Got it. Got it. Okay. So first, let, let's all get on the same page uh, on what the different terminologies are uh, that have to do with the mouthpiece. Uh, and you know, start with a little definition of the terms. And on your handout. Uh, you know, I, I, I've defined some of the common, common things. Did everybody get a handout? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm always looking for a handout. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he stayed at my house. Had to buy him dinner. He and his wife dinner for a whole week. You know, it was awful. But <laughs> anyway, um, the the first page gives you really just a definition of some of the terms we're going to be using today. And so let's get into what makes different mouthpieces different from one another and understand a couple of things about why some mouthpieces work better than others on some horns. Have you noticed that? That you got a mouthpiece that just had it as gangbusters on a Selmer and you put it on a Con and it's awful. Why would that be? And it's really pretty simple. If you look and a saxophone net. And we straightened it out. It would be a truncated cone. Now, I slept through math in the ninth grade. But I know that one day, <coughs> the teacher said something about the fact that if we've got a, a cone, which is what a net basically is, and we cut the end off it off, we can calculate, if we pay attention, this area right in here, the missing portion of the cone. And, and we can determine what the cubic capacity of the volume of that is. Now we also know that our saxophone mouthpiece, what's our mouthpiece, has got a, a, a thing in here that's this area right in here, and that's coming up to this point. And that, we call that the tone chamber. Can you move that out of the corner? Yeah. They can't see that. The board or the tone chamber? The board. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> now, 
somebody get me a room. <laughs> and just let it ride free and pull the pit.
Okay. This, this, is, this is very critical. And, and you probably all run into, into that situation where the horn played perfect for you and the pitch was great and you handed it to them and they're all over the stage. It's almost certainly what it is. Almost certainly. And if, if you'll make them perform that test, you'll, uh, you'll be surprised. Any questions about that? I, I, I can't tell you. That's that. outstanding. That's really good. I, I cannot tell you how important this is. Okay, now let's talk for a minute or two about the different types of mouthpiece designs and um, you, you know the effect they have on the tone just so we're, we're kind of all on the same page about it. The first thing that really affects the tone of the mouthpiece is the baffle. And there are four different types of baffles that are commonly seen. All this is in your hand now. But, all right, this area right in here, that's the back. And on this one that I've drawn, this one's straight. And, you know, that's going to be kind of a nice middle of the road thing. It's not going to color the sound a lot. You're going to get uh, what, what you naturally inputted without a lot of changes. Now, in the late 40s, uh, we began to see this baffle with a little lump in it. And this was called a rollover baffle. And here's the rollover right, right here in that area. And it, it's, it's, I like to think of it as a little speed bump. And that rollover, um, I guess the first time it was really became prominent, Link did it on some of the early mouthpieces that he was making. But then uh, the Bobby Dukoff was the one that really kind of began to make, make that happen. Uh, it, it brightens up the tone just a little bit. Now, and it's pretty commonly used on a lot of a lot of the mouthpieces you see today. You know, taste have changed in uh, what people expect their saxophone to sound like. You know, the, 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 if you listen to recordings made today versus stuff made 30, 40 years ago, that the concept of tone is really radically different. Because uh, guys are using a lot more high battle mouthpieces with smaller chambers. Now, the next baffle type I want to talk about it is really different because it, it's, it's the reverse. Instead of having a speed bump down here like we do with the rollover, we've got a concave thing going on. And that concave baffle is going to give it a little darker sound. Um, a lot of your hard-nosed classical guys really like that. Uh, it's dark, it doesn't have a lot of projection, not a lot of brilliance. Um, I, I like to think of this, and, and this is exaggerated, you'll never see one with a, a hole quite that big in it. But you know, it's, it's like a, you know, just a little trap that traps some of the upper, upper partials. The last type that you're going to commonly see is, is one of these, and these come in all kind of crazy varieties, uh, a step baffle. Where, where you've got multiple angles, you know, it, it's, it's a compound thing. Uh, a good example of that, that probably is going to come across your bench from time to time, is some of the Dukoff superpower chambers, you know, uh, or if you want to see something really extreme of that variety, the uh, Runyon Bionics, you know, the one that's designed only for Altissimo, you know, you can't play anything below G on it, but everything above that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jumbo Java. Yeah. Jumbo, yeah, Jumbo. Yeah. Jumbo. That's, yes. a, that's a baffle attached to a mouthpiece. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's true. But you know, you know, look, look at the mouthpiece, and, and if if the mouthpiece is not getting the kind of sound 
that your customer says they want, maybe the customer's made a poor selection, you know, mm -hmm. in that, and you might suggest some alternatives. Because there are a lot of different mouthpieces out there. Like I said, my company makes 18 different models, and then, you know, like Runyon makes 150 different models. And, you, know, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there, a lot of choices. Oh, okay, so after we get through dealing with the baffle issue, then we've got to talk about changes. We're talking about the relationship between two parts in the mouthpiece here. Okay, here's our mouthpiece. And We want to know is the, we're going to call them A and B. The first thing, if we've got a chamber where it's, it's a big one, where A is greater than B, then you're going to have a very, very, very dark kind of mouthpiece. Um, and right now, my good friend Theo Lani is really promoting this large chamber concept. Um, the larger chambers, although they're dark and somewhat lack projection, they do have one really nice characteristic, and that is that they're, they have a wonderful complexity of tone. I think a mistake that a lot of mouthpiece, neck, and saxophone manufacturers have made in recent years is that we've allowed saxophones to become too bright and too shrill. You know, um, I think if you do an analysis of the spectrum uh, that's come out of the horn, you'll see that some of the horns made today are, there's too much on the upper end. If, if you compare um, a, a, an older, you know, say a, 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 an old Martin or something like that, that they got a lot, lot more lower partials than is going on now. And this really began to change in the 70s, and I got to fault Yamaha with this. And, and Yamaha, by the way, has since corrected what they were, I think the horns Yamaha brought out in the early 70s, which played great, but they were bright. And suddenly everybody said, hey, this is cool. These horns can really be heard. They cut. And so everybody else got in line and followed along and made brighter and brighter horns. Mm -hmm. Well, now, if you play the Yamahas today, they're not like that. They, they're, you know, the Yamaha, I think, has kind of corrected that little sin that anyone wanted to mention. But they really changed everybody's taste. And so now we're seeing darker and darker sounding <coughs> horns that were available. Uh, and all that. Uh, you probably Sanborn's level there on a Mark VI, probably. Yeah, yeah. Kind of prime the thump a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, you can, yeah, and here, but anyway, here, here we're talking about A greater than B. Now, you know, of course, there's also such a thing as having A equal B, where, you know, the, these, this area right in here and this area right in here are the same, and that's going to be, you know, typical medium, you know, middle of the road kind of thing. And then, of course, you can, you know, reverse it one more time, where um, A is smaller than B, and you get that really tiny constriction thing, and that's a Dukov superpower chamber. Uh, and and I'm not, I love Bobby Dukov, and I love his mouthpieces. You know, they play great and all that. Boy, those things are paint peels. You know, or the Vandor and Java, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, whatever. So look at the relative size of all of that if your customer's not happy with what's going on. Okay. That's generally what's going on on chamber and baffle size. Now, the Facing curve length and the type of curve that you have on there. If you go read on the internet, you know, you'll see all these 13-year-old experts from 
lower Montana that have never played any of this stuff, will tell you about, you know, a parabolic curve plays differently from an elliptical curve and all of that good stuff. I'm not sure. If they have some different playing characteristics, but that doesn't seem to have a great deal to do with the sound that ultimately comes out of the saxophone. Now, that being said, if you have the facing curve, the curve is, is, is like this. And this is the point at which the reed is tangent to the, the rails of the mouthpiece. If you have a short curve, and we'll talk about how to measure those in a minute, the short curve is going to tend to make the upper notes a little easier. If you have a longer curve, it's going to tend to make the lower notes a little easier. And if you've got a customer that says, my mouth, D, I love the way it plays, but everything below low D is hard to produce, and you check everything else out, it's okay. You might lengthen that facing curve for them a little bit. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, if it's shorter, you can all, or if he's having trouble with the high notes, you might shorten the curve a little bit. But the business about whether this area from here to here is, you know, what, what the geometrical specification of that is, be it elliptical or parabolic, uh, you know, it might have something to do with the playing response, but not the ultimate sound. And it also does not affect intonation. That's not. That, I, I just think that's me. Uh, any questions about just general mouthpiece kind of? Is that, yes, sir? I got one. Um, just for like combining mouthpiece, I know you can uh, get the specs on the, the chamber and the, the diameter of the face and whatever, but how do you know about the bathroom? Like, what? Is there anything? You, you, when, when you're like, like you, you're looking look at the catalog, look at the catalog on, on the web page, <laughs> and how you tell them, yeah. you really can't. And, and, and um, I, I know on our web page, we try to show you pictures of it from multiple angles, <laughs> so, but most people don't do that. I'm not saying they are right and, you know, they're wrong. People should do that. Uh, I know, for example, the Bert Lars in my pieces, now they have a real good system. Um, if you got a Bert Larsen mouthpiece and it's 120 over 2 SMS, uh, you can take those numbers and you know the tip opening is 120 thousandths of an inch. Uh, Berg has four different chambers that they make, zero being the smallest, one being next smallest, two being next, you know, et cetera, three being the largest, and they offer two curves, an M curve, which is kind of a standard curve, and an SMS curve, which is a shorter curve. So with, with their system, which I think is a great one, you can tell what's going on. Uh, outside of their system, I don't know anybody else. Does, doesn't Lakey have some kind of thing that you can judge chamber size? Does anybody know? I don't remember. There's somebody else that gives you some kind of chamber size. <coughs> but pretty much you just kind of look at it. Okay. And, and to kind of expand on, on your question a little bit. You know, how do you know what to buy? Yeah. I think the only way you can intelligently buy mouthpieces is just like buying shoes. You need to go to the store and try them on, you know, and you'll know when it fits. Uh, I can also tell you that a mouthpiece that works for me may not work for Jeff Peterson and vice versa, you know. Um, our physiology is different. You know, not, not just our concept of sound, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I play a mouthpiece and I'm going to sound like me, and I hand the same mouthpiece to Kurt and he's going to sound like Kurt because it's not just the equipment. Because remember, your body must be one with the saxophone. That's part of what makes the sound. You know, no matter what you do. You're not going to sound like me, and I'm never going to sound like you because our bodies are there. You know, and that's an important, important thing to do. Um, now, on this business about the different materials sound different, I'm not real sure. Um, I know when I was working with Runyon, we had one model in particular that we made in three different materials. 
and they were made on the same machine. Uh, everything was the same except the material. And yeah, those seemed to sound different. Uh, I never could figure out exactly why, because uh, I, I don't think that hard rubber consistently sounds different from metal, and I'm not sure that stainless steel consistently sounds different from brass or other metals. Um, I, I have read a number of doctoral <coughs> dissertations and such as that, you know, where there was real bona fide academic research on that with contradictory results. Uh, and I know I've got, a, uh, those of you who have been to my place, I, there's a, in my teaching studio, there is a rack that's as long as this table, and that uh, it's got three shelves on it, and it's full of mouthpieces, and they're all my mistakes, because over the years I have bought hundreds and hundreds of mouthpieces, each new mouthpiece was going to solve all my playing problems, and, you know, um, none of them did. Uh, so, but you know, you know, I've got I've got a couple of hard rubber mouthpieces. Uh, I've got I've got a Dukoff hard rubber that Bobby made in the '50s that is louder and brighter than anything else I've ever played. It's hard rubber. Go figure. I I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I I think it's more about chamber and, and baffle design <coughs> than it is about material. Um, we choose in our company to manufacture some models in hard rubber. We do manufacture most of our metal, uh, most of our mouthpieces in brass. We do make uh, a stainless steel mouthpiece. Um, the reason we chose those materials was really to facilitate manufacturing processes more than uh, anything else. That, that was our decision. So I don't know. Okay, let's talk about what, what's wrong with that mouthpiece that the customer's got in the case that you didn't play. <laughs> All right, I took some junk mouthpieces and I went to my backyard and I spray painted them white so I could make some cuts on them and so you could see. And so I'm going to do a couple things to these and then I'm going to pass them around and you can see. So little Johnny comes in and the horn leaked and you, you, you replaced a couple of pads and got everything straightened out and you hand the horn to little Johnny and he blows and it still doesn't work for him. It was a good read. Wonder what's wrong. The first thing to check, the first thing to check is this. The table of the mouthpiece, this area right here, has got to be not sort of flat. It's got to be dead flat. It's got to be absolutely flat. And I want to tell you something else. Uh, a mutual friend of ours recently uh, forwarded a, a video that Matt had done. Is that on YouTube? Yeah. That, okay. I'll tell you something else. Back the reed's got to be flat too. <laughs> and how many of you flatten the backs of your reeds before you put one on? None of you. Oh, all right, Peters. Uh, yes. Maybe Peterson does. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. right. I, I do. I, I have for years. You know, I never read out of the box. I, I got, you know, piece piece of glass. I flatten every one of them. You need to because this area's got to be flat. Now, how do we tell if it's flat? You don't need a lot of fancy measuring equipment. What you got to do is contact my good friends at Music Medic. Yeah. Never heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> and they sell sheet glass. Now, it's not ordinary glass. Special glass. Don't go to the hardware store and get some window pane, you, you know, because that's too thin and the first time you go down on it. It's you a pain to use, really. Yeah, it's a pain to use. One more. One more. That's half a pain. Okay, but this is this is good and thick. The edges are ground, so you know knuckleheads like me won't cut their fingers. So put the glass on flat surface and get some fairly coarse emery paper. Now um, we've got here. Uh, this is 400. That ought to do. 
put it here, take the mouthpiece, and first give it a little pass like this. One direction, up and down. Then you might want to give it another pass, other direction, back and forth. And before long, I'm going to get a, expand that mark just a little bit, then we'll pass this around. Yeah. Okay. Now, I painted the mouthpieces white, and I did a crappy job, but you can now see this thing's got some significant high spots on this side. And that means if it's high on that side, <coughs> it's leaking on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't go very far with that. So, you, you know, ordinarily I, I want to dress that thing down until it is absolutely flat all the way. Yes, sir? Question. Uh, now, if your mouthpiece is like that, do you still get a seal? Like, you won't get like, as good a one as you need. If you, like, go ahead and suck and you get that seal in the pocket, can you put it in? Does that mean it's mean they still can mess it up? You can have a high spot, but especially if you create a vacuum, uh -huh. you're gonna suck the reed up to a low yeah. spot. And you'll get some, yeah, you know, but it's still not right. Yes. Yeah. Now some, something Matt's video pointed out was that once you get some moisture introduced into the reed, yeah. reed may swell up a little bit mm -hmm. and generate another high spot. So there's another issue. Mm -hmm. But you've got to knock those high spots down. And if you don't, that mouthpiece is not going to play with its best. Steve, can yeah. the ones that are stamped that have the divots in them? Where, where, where they're stamped in the table? Mm -hmm. uh, that, they need to be flattened out, you know. And you get everything flat except for that stamp is. Yeah, you can. And you, that's recessed. Well, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah like a late oh, okay. yeah, There is a school out. of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, let, we'll address that. No, no, no. No, not at all. Okay, the question was, what about a recess in here where it was stamped? And I think the uh, minor, do they still do that? Mm -hmm. Lakey. 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 Okay, yeah, and, and I forget who else does that. Lakey. Yeah, okay. So there is a school of thought that says you ought to build a little suction cup into the middle of the table. And you can do that by taking some abrasive paper. <clears throat> and doing essentially that. Now I'm doing all this quick and dirty today just to illustrate this. You know, you got to make it pretty. It's going to charge you money for doing this. But um, but anyway, in theory, this is a little sucker that's going to help suck that reed. I don't know about that either. But may maybe that's true. Oh. Maybe it's a sucker that buys it. <laughs> you were already on probation. <laughs> yeah. Now we know who drank the Maker's Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, it, it's you know I cannot emphasize the importance of making the table nice and flat. Go no further until the table is flat. Now, as we're flattening out the table, and let's flatten out another one of these guys here, a couple other things might happen. So, we're going to take this guy, and we're going to take this one on down pretty far. And when the paper starts to load up, get another sheet. Because paper's cheap. And anybody that does a lot of mouthpiece work knows that paper's cheap. And it begins to load up. As we flatten these guys out, what begins to happen is this. We begin to not only get the table flat, but we begin to cut over here into the side rails and they get wider and wider and wider. Yeah, well, that's not the face curve yet. You're getting ahead of the lesson, but yeah. Yeah. 
And when we do that, we're changing the geometry of this whole die. And so a facing curve that maybe we wanted to measure 40 on the gauge is now measuring 34. And this is not good. So I'm going to have to go back and do that. Now, what's the downside of wide rails? If you look at most of the student type of mouthpieces, you'll see that the side rails and the tip rail are pretty wide relative to what you see on professional quality mouthpieces. Now, the width of the side rails and tip rails is a two-edged sword. With wide rails comes uh, control, you know, uh, they're very forgiving, etc. They also kind of absorb the sound. They lack projection. Now look, a mouthpiece that has narrow rails is going to be a little harder to control, but it's going to give you a lot more bang for the buck. It's going to articulate quicker. Oh, this one, yeah, this one's really out of kilter. Yeah, but over here, yeah, you can see that this side rail, as I cut this down, and I haven't even got the tape flash yet. It's really beginning to get wide. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting crazy wide. And look up here. Man, I have shortened this curve a lot. Not a good thing. Because this curve has got to be balanced very well. And this, and, you know, I don't know what these, how these are going to measure what I'm paying for. Um, so this this is one that's going to require some fairly major attention here in order to play right. Yeah, this this rail is getting wider and wider and wider. So we're going to take our music magic mouthpiece gauge. Where do you get those? You get, you get these music magic. Right. Are they on the website yet? They are on the website. I think they ship free like everything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also get these feelers from Music Maddie. Um, I got I got a whole bunch of dealer gauges here because I, I use a zillion different sizes. Most people that reface mouthpieces use about seven different sizes. Uh, and all that. I probably use 20 because I, I, I'm fussy. Uh, but you want to start with a 15, 10 thousandths feeler. And that's where it's kind of been acknowledged in the industry that we define the start of the curve as far as this concerns. And what you want to do, you want to put this guy in here, the gauge is graduated. And you don't want to, you hold the gauge in place with your thumb. You drop this guy in and see where it stops. Now, yeah. see that? Mm -hmm. Not good. Um, what you want to do is you got to determine what that facing specification should be. And I give you a chart in your handout of what a typical, mm -hmm. some typical facing measurements are and adjust the mouthpiece accordingly. Um, so over here, it was too high on that side, so I might take one of my little files here, and I might make a couple of cuts at that point. And ordinarily, I do not eyeball this. I will mark with a, a Sharpie off on the mouthpiece where I need to make my cuts. But here, can you see in the back, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. So let's see if I did any good and got this down. Ooh, it's pretty even now. Okay. Doesn't, all, I, doesn't always go that easy. <laughs> A lot of times you'll have to sit there and fuss with it for 30 <coughs> minutes to get that uh, get that to do. But you then have to figure out what your facing schedule is going to be 
and make multiple cuts. Now, if you make a cut, you know, say here on a rail, and then you make another one here on the rail, you know, in order to get this, then what happens is you, you're going to have, you know, a series of straight lines, you know, and that's not good. So to smooth those out, take it and with a nice even pressure, draw it across the paper and, and knock those little corners off with a nice gentle pressure. Like that. And once we got that done, then we ought to have, you know, and, and measure with multiple feelers, then it's time to deal with the excess width on these rails. Now, when the rail starts getting too wide on the sides, remember that it's getting too wide both inside and outside. So you got to deal with it both look at, you know, you can't go one side or the other. You got to deal with both. Take your file on this one that's a little too wide. And your digital caliper, which you can buy from music.com. Determine what your width should be. Measure, measure twice, cut once. And get these guys nice and even like you want them. Or uh, narrow is better if your player's got a chop to do it. Now that gets the inside. Let's see the interest of everybody understanding what we're doing. But what about the outside? My favorite tool for dealing with the outside of these on all kind of mouthpieces except stainless steel, which is just too damn hard to cut with one of these, are these really great emery boards that you get at beauty supply houses. And, and these these have a rubber center, and so they're nice and flexible, you know? And they're, I buy these things in boxes like shoe boxes, you know, because I go through a ton of them. Take this and Assuming for the purposes of discussion that these rails are a little bit wide, make some cuts like this. And just again, now, now we're getting somewhere. Oh yeah. And you can see as we pass this one around that we have significantly narrowed the side of the rail. Now, of course, after you do all this, you're going to have to get in there, uh, you know, after you finish, polish it all up. You know, I use a, a Fordham motor tool to do all that. And if it's a metal mouthpiece, you know, the same kind of rouge and polishing compounds that you use, you know, on the body. If it's a plastic or a hard rubber mouthpiece, I use kit scratch out, which you can get at any auto parts store. I didn't find anything that worked better than that. But um, it, it's important to get those side rails squared up. Now, we got the side rails squared up. We got another problem, the tip rail. If you take your average mouthpiece, you're going to find that, that tip rail is probably not square. Uh, by square, I mean even. <clears throat> so we're going to test it in somewhat the same fashion that we did the side rails or the table. We're going to actually draw it on the paper. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make it a little bigger so it's a little more visible to those of you sitting in the back. Yeah. Can you, can you see that? Where the high spots were? We'll pass it around in just a minute. Well, this, this thing doesn't seal. It's, when, when we test one of these like this, we want to keep working it until we get the entire end of it leaving a trail 
of material on the paper. Now here I got white paint, so it's a little easier to see. But um, that's very important. So just looking at this one, that doesn't seal well at all. And once again, you can suck that thing down like you said. But I'm not sure that's a very valid test. If you have a rail at the tip that is too wide, it will slow down the articulation and it will make the thing dead sound. So how do you narrow a tip rail? Careful. You want to take a somewhat narrow file. Let me find the one up there. And I'm going to make, let me draw these. This is hard to see. Here's, do we have another marker? This one seems to be. Mm -hmm. okay. It's coming? Yeah, we can't see that. Oh, okay, yeah, you can't see that. Um, but. Oh, I'm waiting for that question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Matt. No problem. Um, what do, what do chamfered rails do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they do much anything. Okay. Uh, uh, because only a, a, a certain portion of it is actually in direct contact with the reed, and I think that's all that matters. Do, do you hold a contrary opinion? I don't know. The reason I ask is because I, I've noticed. This might be crazy, but the best bird horses I've ever played all have chamfered rails. And like their facing is slightly different. And I couldn't figure out whether it's because the facing is slightly different or whether the chamfered thing was something. Or is it just that mouth thing? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I can think of no reason that that would, that the chamfered rail on, on its own would make a difference. I, 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 it doesn't make sense to me. Would you define chamfered rail for us, please? Yeah. Um, oh, God bless you. Um, a chamfered rail has a, what you call it, a groove? It's like a, just a basically a you know, 45 degree yes. angle heading on the inside of the, the yeah. rail towards the inside of the mouthpiece. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a bit very small. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 don't, I, I don't think there's anything going on here. Okay, here's our mouthpiece tip. And right now, we've got a tip rail that looks kind of like this. And we're going to say that's too wide. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our file and we're going to make some diagonal cuts here. And I'm only going to do half of this mouthpiece. I'm going to hold the file at an angle, and you'll, and you'll see when I pass this around. And it's going to remove a little material and narrow that rail for you. And before you do that, and it looks play, play, play. So let's take this guy and narrow it down just a little bit. Yeah. I'm only going to cut about half of it. Once again, in these examples I'm doing for you today, I, I'm, I'm doing these very much quick and dirty. We, we would, uh, just so you can understand the, the basic technique. You're taking the corner off on the inside of the mouthpiece. Can you see it's where? The edge yeah, of the inside. See kind of where, where I am. <clears throat> you know, I want to kind of, you, you got to, you know, you got to learn to. Hold your file at the correct angle. Get that going on. I, I will tell you that all of these little fine cuts on this, you have to learn to, of all the repair skills that I've acquired in the years I've been doing it, I, I find, I've found mouthpiece uh, work to be far and away the most difficult and demanding. Uh, it's hard to just get the touch we're taking off just a little bit. Point, point on the drawing exactly there. Are you removing <coughs> on this inner chamber of the mouthpiece or on the uh, 
I, I'm cut. I'm cut the rail. I think when this comes around to you, it'll see it. Yeah, I see it now. I, I, I think so. Yeah, and you can see. It should be these bounds. I can see it now. Not a lot, Lee, but but yeah, yeah, yeah. There was there was, and I think the amount of stuff that came off the baffle on that one is more paint where I spray painted them so you could see easily. Because what I what I was really trying to do was cut cut the tip back a, a little bit. I, I think we did pick up a little paint from, from that, which you wouldn't ordinarily see um, as we narrowed that, narrowed that rail down just a little bit. See? Yeah. Why when you remove it from the end, the edge? Yeah, what happens if you just take it out? Oh, 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 oh. You mean go like from the outside right over here? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you can do that, but here's what you're going to run into. Uh, sometimes you do have to reshape the tip, um, and when, when you do that, you know, say to fit the rig, you know, you find that the mouthpiece just didn't fit in the rig, you know, you, you're going on and you're doing that and such as that. You can narrow it like that, but you're going to end up with the, the very end of the beak a little okay. too thick sometimes. Not, not necessarily a good thing. I find it hard to control up there just to get that exact cut the way I want to as well. Yes, Real, realizing, you know, everybody has different opinions, but things look like five minutes away from Ralph Morey. Mm -hmm. And he was like, on the table, he would make the table a little... Put a suction cup in. So when the reed expanded, yeah. it wouldn't pull away and leak. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I think there may be some, you know, it makes sense. Uh, I don't do that uh, ordinarily, but I know people like Ralph did, John Van Wee used to do that. Um, and some other, you know, people that certainly knew what they were doing. Um, I don't think, as long as you leave a, you know, a perimeter all around, mm -hmm. you, you know, where you get the seal, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It may have some merits, but you, you know, I, I won't say that's a bad thing at all. Um, I, I know I just don't use customarily do that. You know, I just was saying somewhere behind, somewhere around. Oh, okay. On your timer. Oh, okay. Oh, um, yes. Is the reason you're going on a diagonal, going into change the tip rail? A to stay off the side rail and yes. B so you don't change the baffle? All of the above. Okay, thank you. All, all, all of the above. I want to make sure I understood. Oh, oh okay. So, so since I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, another couple, couple of things that you can do. If you look at this area here in the throat, right under the table, you've got a big vertical surface. <coughs> you can make this mouthpiece play a lot better if you will cut that boy down to a, an almost knife kind of edge. Um, all brands? Yeah. All brands. Yeah. And it does what to it? You, you, um, where, where the, the mouthpiece, um, I got a good camera to draw with now. Um, under the, under the window, you've got a, 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 a thing like this. You know, that comes in here. Cut this in. Usually, on most of them, it's shaped more like that. Mm -hmm. Cut that down so, so, so there's not that vertical surface. There. Make it less restricted? Absolutely. No, I don't find any difference. Not, not, you know, all things being equal. 
If everything's straight, square, like it ought to be, and all that, no. One other thing, if you want to hot rod your mouthpiece just a little bit. Hey, white. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look at the beak, look at it in this profile. Take your final and cut this beak down where this top section here is a little thinner. It will really open up the way the mouthpiece speaks. It will make it louder, more resonant. Just what we need the louder saxophone. <laughs> Higher pressure, louder. Yeah. Or, or, or the new oh, ones. So this, is, this, is, this is one of our new models. Uh, and, and this, by the way, I'll pass this around. Uh, I just got these Thursday night. This is one of my new designs. This is exactly the way I got them from the factory. Now, this one had to have the table leveled and all of that good stuff. But, you know, we make the first one. Um, and then send it, send it to them and tell them to, you know, make us a couple of hundred of these and if you do different places. But it, as I cut this down like this and reduce the height yes, it is. this will make this a lot more. Yeah, there you go, we get a little duck up going on, on that. Okay, so Kurt's beating me up about time. Uh, I think you got jipped a little bit on your time when you're playing keyboard. You know that. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Any uh, any other quick questions? Or I, you know, I'll be around. Anybody wants to buy me a drink tonight? And ask me all the questions you want. <laughs> you know, I, I like Basil From Hayden. Trump. Basil Hayden, straight up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. So after everything, after you finish, you get a mouthpiece, and you, after you finish with everything, is the is the sound still the same? No. Like, it's just easier to play, or is it well, easier? well, I I, I I can do that. Or, or, or I, I, you want to change the sound? I can do that too. You, you know, I can make it darker by enlarging the chamber, for example, or, or you know, making the baffle lower. Or I can add another baffle by building it up with some epoxy or other materials. Yes, ma'am. Uh, two of the sax guys that I do regular work for, they heard about this plant. I told them I was coming. We're going to be looking at mouthpiece facing. They said specifically. I was supposed to ask about the teal facing. Yeah, the teal facing that they, they did on the um, long shank cylinders <laughs> is a little longer alto facing. A standard, what they were selling is the C-star on the scroll, long scroll shank, mm -hmm. uh, measures on a standard mouthpiece gauge about 40, and the teal facing I think is 42 or 43. Mm -hmm. And I'll stand for correction on those numbers, but that's about the difference. It's just, it's, it's a longer curve. Okay, and that's, that's the only difference? That's the only difference. These, that's these guys are in the mouthpiece. That's the only difference. I think that's well, the only difference. Yeah. On the teal form, they just look where it also plays in the mouthpiece. I don't, I've I, 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 I got a couple of those, and, and mine are not round. Now, I've got some silver. I've got some pre-World War II silver medals that all, the old Marcel and Ulay yeah. and those are completely round. Yeah, but um, I, don't, I think they may have made them both, but I don't know. Yeah. The Selmer S80s are square, and the Selmer S90s are round, and you can get those in C star, G, D star. Any other? Because I'm running out of time and I'm sorry. Anything else? All right, well, I hope you learned something. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're done with the clinics. Um, we'll be back in. Let's do the open discussion in this room. Uh, we'll do that at about 5:15, and Matt is going to moderate. Matt Scott from Music Medic is going to moderate that discussion, so there's no fighting. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we'll, we'll get us clinicians up here to do it. We'll be, we'll be back in about at about 5:15, which is about 10 minutes from now. You end up at six. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Six o'clock at the end. Yes. 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 Yes.